Kings chapter 2. We're going to read verses 14 to 26 in James chapter 2. A lot of people don't like James because James can get on the case. But, uh, <laughs> and you can get under your skin, but um, he's there. So we're going to read James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Could such faith save him? Suppose a brother or a sister is not clothed in daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did? When he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. <clears throat> One of the things that, that our tradition is very good at, and, and I've discovered, I, I, I do this, um, I do this pretty, I pretty well too, is we're very good at focusing on our personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We, we, we talk about that a lot. Even, even, even if you're, I was, when I was looking through the hymn book to pick songs for this morning, I was having trouble picking songs to go along with James' theme because a lot of our songs have to do with your own personal walk with God. And that's a good thing. We all need a relationship with God that can only be had through faith in Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons, though, that some traditions focus on this is because other traditions tend to emphasize works or deeds as a means of attaining salvation, as if salvation can be gained through doing a certain amount of stuff or good works for God. But I don't think any of us actually believes that we're saved because of what we do. Well, how do you know you're saved? Well, I did this, 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 and this. That means I'm saved. We don't think that way. <clears throat> but one of the traps we can get caught in is addressed here by James. It's one thing to know Jesus is Savior, to have faith. But listen to what James says in chapter 2, verse 14. Listen again. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such a faith <laughs> save him? Can he? I mean, this is obviously a rhetorical question, but when the question gets asked like this, the answer is probably no. Because he's obviously, it, it's a rhetorical question. We're, we're, we're saved because of our faith. We're saved, you know, I, I said we're not careful. If we aren't careful, faith in and of itself can become our work. Can. And then we think we're saved because of our faith. Are we saved because of our faith? Are we saved because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ? You know, I can't faith my way. <coughs> faith, faith is kind of a passive. It's, 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 it's both. It's kind of an active thing. It's also a passive thing because, because it's all about what Jesus did. And if we believe in Jesus, we have eternal life. It's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus has done. And the way James is asking his question again, yeah, he wants us to he wants us to get it. No, he, he gives us an example. Suppose suppose somebody you know comes in and says, "Hey, church, I don't have any food. I don't have any clothes." And we say, "Well, go ahead and be successful. You know, be, be well fed, and we don't do anything to help them." What good is that? I mean, we want them to be. But now sometimes we can't always we can't help everybody because I mean. But we, but we, but we, 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 we should. We should try. I mean, have you, have you ever helped a person that wishes them well? You know, this reminds me of a story. I had a story that kind of made me chuckle. Hopefully, it makes you chuckle. Of a, a bunch of a bunch of Christian do-gooders. We, we, we do-gooderism in Christianity is the same thing. But a bunch of do-gooders wanted to help homeless people. With their <laughs> savior. So they collected a bunch of money, and they brought a hundred frozen turkeys. And they gave and distributed 100 frozen turkeys to all the homeless people in town. Now think about that for a minute. 
What good is a frozen turkey for a homeless person? Because odds are they don't have a home, guess what they don't have either? A way to cook a turkey. But they did a good job and they raised some money and they gave a bunch of more stuff. Talk about a swing and a miss. Verse 17, faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And not just action, good action. Appropriate action. Action that makes a difference in the lives of others. Not just action that makes us feel good about doing something. You know, there's a difference. Action that just makes us feel good about ourselves is what James addresses in verse 18. <coughs> but some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Look at what I do. Look at all the stuff that I do. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. James is talking about faith in action. Let's see if I can get this right. My fingers don't always want to work right. Faith in action. Three words, not faith in action. Two words, right? Three words versus two words. Faith in action, not faith in action. Faith without action is dead. And trust me, the last thing the world needs is more deadness, right? Does the world, hey, do we need to tell the world that you need to be alive? We can't demonstrate that to you by being dead. James even goes so far as to say you believe in one God, and he basically kind of kind of gets in our face a little bit, doesn't he? So you believe in one God? Good, good. What do you do? Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. Belief there is one God in heaven isn't salvation worthy. Because Satan and all his cronies, and even a whole bunch of other religions out there believe in one God. I mean, a lot of them believe in the wrong God. You know, you can make you can make up any kind of thing you want and say, oh, I don't believe in one God. His name's Paul. You know? Well, that what you do. You're no different than Satan. And then he goes on to see, then he goes, then, then, then James, you know, he goes to the one place he knows he can get straight to the heart of the fact you're any Jewish person. He goes to Abraham. And if you want to get the attention of a Jew, the Jewish people, you talk about Abraham. Because they all know Abraham. They love Abraham. He's the patriarch. He was the first Jew called by God to leave his family, to leave it all, and become a new nation to start all over. God's doing something new. He's going to use Abraham to bring his salvation message to the world. And Abraham's their hero. If Abraham did it, they'll do it. If Abraham didn't do it, they don't want any part of it. So James tells the story about Abraham and Isaac. And how Abraham took Isaac. And you all know the story, but if you don't know, even if you do know it, I'm going to remind you. He took his son Isaac and they headed up the mountain with everything they needed to make sacrifice, except the lamb. Which is kind of the most important thing. You know, the, the creator is the most important thing. And, and Isaac realized that he's dead. Where's the lamb? And Abraham responds. Abraham responds simply, God will provide. And Abraham proceeds to offer Isaac on the altar. And he's just about ready to kill the boy. And I mean, I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen this in the movies or not, but I don't think I want to see this in the movies. So I, don't, I don't think I want to see a guy take his son, bind him all up, and get ready to actually do what he was going to do. Abraham was considered righteous for what he did. And just about as he's ready to strike down Isaac, God provides. But Abraham had to get to here, didn't he, before God provided. And sometimes we have to get to here before God provides. He was considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the Lord. It wasn't enough for Abraham to believe. It wasn't just enough for him to believe. He had to have a knife in the air. Right, you hear about the hear about the crew who uh this is an odd example today, but it hadn't rained for a couple months, and it was a drought, and they gathered to decide to pray for rain, and nobody brought an umbrella, so the pastor canceled the effort because the people didn't have enough faith to pray for rain and bring an umbrella just in case it worked. Faith in action. The knife, the knife has to be here before God's gonna answer our prayers sometimes. And that's the thing. Abraham was ready to kill us. Because he believed. That's faith in action. That's what James is talking about. <clears throat> Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. His belief was carried out by his actions. What he knew up here. Right? Played out for what he did right here. I've, I've, I've been talking about this a lot lately. Because this is, this is where we this is where we end, right? This is where we decide what we're going to do. And this is what we do it with. Right? And we've got to be thinking of the right stuff. So we can do the right stuff. So it, it, it's both, isn't it? It is so both, isn't it? You can do all the right stuff. 
I had a professor one time, Dr. Tuttle, and when in doubt, I'm quoting professors, Dr. Tuttle, he said, some of the deadest churches in the world believe all the right stuff. Belief in action. Why do you think churches die? It's not because they don't believe the right stuff. It's because they took the word in and action and made it one word and made it in action. And they stopped, they stopped producing fruit. You know, James tells us that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone. Faith in action. Even, even Rahab. Even Rahab, who didn't have a very good profession, was considered righteous. Why? Because she helped the spies. She helped God's people. It isn't enough to know what to do. It isn't enough to believe. Verse 26 sums it up. As the body, this, this, this example will drive it all the way on. As the body without the spirit is dead, faith without deeds is dead. The body without the spirit is what we do when we go down to various in 2 to 4 and 7 to 9 and get our view. We are viewing the body without the spirit. And we all, unfortunately, we know what that looks like. It looks, it looks dead. And that body you're looking at in the casket, James is comparing to faith without deeds. Dead. Like the body with the spirit missing. Looks a little different than it did the day before, whenever we were talking to the person and they were there. Faith without deeds is the same as a body lying in a casket. Their funeral. Dead. So we aren't saved because of what we do. The evidence of our salvation is shown by our actions, our faith and actions. So the question we all need to ask ourselves is this. If, if, you, if you were on a trial today, maybe you've heard this before, if you were on a trial today and the charges against you were being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to bring a conviction? Are our works, our actions flowing out of what we claim to believe? James tells us earlier in chapter 1, and have you ever tried to look up something in the Bible and have trouble finding it? Because you just look in the wrong place. Should have read James 1 before I read James 2. That actually makes sense. <laughs> but I read the entire rest of James, and then I went back to James 1. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Another translation kind of makes up a word here, and it's why it says, be doers of the word. I don't know if doer is a word or not, but you all know what it means. Be doers of the word. Jesus didn't come here to die on a cross when you hear about it and say, oh, gee, that's nice. Did he? He did it to set an example of how we should live. He did live to please himself. Did Jesus live to please himself? Did that look like fun on the cross? Did that, did that look self-fulfilling? It didn't look nothing to me. He lived to serve others. And I talked last week about being sacrificial. And the gospel, it's funny in a way, isn't it? On one hand, it's simple and easy. Jesus saves all you have to do is all you have to do is believe. But on the other hand, it cost him his life. And that was hard. And because he caused us to follow him, on one hand, it's simple and easy. But what's it going to cost us? It's hard. Sacrifice is hard, isn't it? And if it wasn't, if it wasn't, we'd have a better word for it. We'd have easy time. You know, not sacrifice. Faith without deeds is dead. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Now, as we prepare for communion this morning. The ushers are going to serve, they're going to bring it to you and serve you in the pews, and we're going to all partake together. Because while there is a very personal aspect of communion, where it's one-on-one, -on -one, you and God, there's also a group aspect, the team aspect, the common union aspect that binds us all together, and we serve one another here at home. No one. You aren't here to get something, are you? You're going to get something, but you aren't here to get something. You're here to give something. And to do so sacrificially, the way Christ lived, to serve and to save us. Let's pray. Father God, help us, Lord, to, to take these words that James speaks. Lord, really, all the words of Scripture, Lord, to take them seriously, Lord. And not just to hear it, Lord, but to be prepared to do it. And sometimes, Lord, it's going to require of us more than we think we can give. <clears throat> Lord, they require a lot more of you than the name of God, anybody can give. We pray, Lord, you would help us to, to find a way, Lord, to, to live sacrificially for you the way you live for us. Lord, be with us, Lord, now as we, as we share together, Lord, your meal. In Jesus' name, amen.